to go. Good to go. It's just our slides a bit. So, as I said, welcome to our webinar, the future of supply chain management, rethinking global supply chain models. Uh, so this event was organized in partnership with Supply Chain Canada. And my name is Julia Nascimento, and I will be moderating this session. So before we get started, I, I just wanted to uh, cover a few things that will help uh, you to improve your experience today. So if you are on a VPN, please disconnect it as you uh, it will slow down your connection and any other applications open. So this will help you to have a better experience on the platform. And we do have a chat, but we would actually prefer if you put your questions into the Q&A. That way you can see the questions that other people have asked and you can vote on those questions, which means that um, the most popular questions will mo move up to the top. We ask, we, um, ask you to try to keep your questions at the topic at hand, and we'll ask, uh, answer the questions as we go. But um, we'll keep the questions only related to the topic at hand. And then we'll have a, a quick general Q&A at the end. Also, the recording will be sent uh, to you by email uh, by tomorrow. And lastly, now I would like to pass it over to Mr. John Graddick, MBA, faculty lecturer, and academic program coordinator of our aviation program and our host today. Thank you very much, John. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever you happen to be in, uh, in this domain of uh, webinars. Um, I'm John Graddock. I am a faculty lecturer at McGill School of Continuing Studies. I uh, lecture in the supply chain program as well as the aviation management program. And today we're going to talk about a subject which I think a lot of us uh, really, uh, as consumers, as uh, managers, as people in the manufacturing, the service industries, all have an opinion about what's going on with supply chains. Uh, we all understand, you know, generally speaking, that we are all part of a supply chain. Uh, we all participate <laughs> in actions associated with. Uh, providing product, delivering product. Uh, and so the, the objective of today's session is to really share with you views from a number of people who are what I would call leaders in the supply chain uh, process uh, across various industries and to have us have a look at what it is that drives uh, organizations to try to um, solidify their supply chain practices. So this morning, um, we have four individuals we're going to be talking to. Um, first is Damir Yabonovich, who's the operations manager at uh, a small little firm in Montreal that's called Amazon. Uh, and uh, Damir is going to be talking to us a bit about um, the world of supply chain from an Amazon perspective. Damir is a, uh, an individual that's, uh, that I know quite well. He's a graduate of the uh, supply chain program at McGill, um, has uh, spent a few years in supply chain, both in uh, transportation as well as, as uh, sortation. Uh, he is now actively involved in the arrival of Amazon's distribution and operating fulfillment sections in Montreal. Um, the next individual we have is Dimitrios Manolopoulos, a senior director of strategic sourcing and IT at the National Bank. Um, Dimitrios is highly knowledgeable in terms of sourcing and strategic sourcing in 20 years in telecom, banking, financial services and looking at particularly introducing process improvement initiatives uh, and looking at leading functional teams and looking at a number of interesting evolving supply chain strategies. We also have Martin Senecal, who's Vice President of Procurement at Resolute Forest Products. Uh, Martin previously worked as a Senior Strategic Sourcing Manager for Resolute's Tissues Division, was part of the project team uh, for the um, tissue operations in Tennessee. And before joining Resolute, he worked as a supplier to the pulp and paper and tissue industry and is a graduate of the University of Sherbrooke in chemical engineering and completed an MBA in 2007. And lastly, but not least, we have Nikolai Brasilov, supply chain manager at Medtronic and a fellow course lecturer of mine at the University in Supply Chain. Um, 
Nikolai has been a uh, was also a vice president, ex vice president of Apex Montreal chapter, uh, and has the uh, amazing reputation of being a coach of the McGill team and has won multiple records in the international student case competition over the last seven years. And uh, welcome, welcome to all of you, gentlemen. Um, and uh, what we'll do is basically start a session off by uh, asking, uh, going around the horn, as we say, and asking individuals questions about um, specific areas of supply chain that might be of interest to you and to them, of course, they can basically provide your view. So I'll start with Damir uh, and talk about, you know, the way in which um, COVID-19 um, has impacted Amazon and where is it that Amazon has had to change some of its distribution and e-commerce practices as a result of the, uh, the pandemic? Damir, over to you. Thank you, John. So the main impact was on, of course, as every other firm, as every other company globally, is primarily placing safety of every single associate employee, management, all support functions and suppliers first. This, how did this impact it? It reduced capacity because we had to stretch the operations where compensation over, uh, uh, over vast areas of divisions, you could have uh, narrowed it down by increasing manpower. Now we had to rely on technology and more fluid flow of uh, operations, like including transportation, including uh, fulfillment center, including last mile. It also made training a lot more uh, challenging as we had to increase the distance between the trainers and uh, the newly appointed staff, both in the operations and managerial and virtual suppliers as well. So the impact was the placing safety first, making sure that uh, we work uh, according to the guidelines of the provinces or the countries that we are present in. And then most importantly, ensuring that we go a step above. Like Amazon, for example, implemented uh, amazing technology to uh, evaluate uh, the distance between two employees or two people in the fulfillment centers, in delivery stations, in sortation centers. And that actually uh, has risen our ability to ensure the safety of everybody else and ourselves, of course. So reduce capacity, yes, but we do what we actually promise to do. Put our employees first and by that doing so, placing our customers first, because most of our employees are also our customers. Perfect. Thank you, Demir, much appreciated. And I know that we'll have a lots of questions about Amazon and Amazon's performance and uh, some, uh, I got some, I got some personal stories about Amazon delivery as most people do have over this, uh, over the last 15 months. So uh, we all have our opinions and we all have our, our, uh, our stars and our uh, not so starry experiences with e-commerce. Thank you. Uh, I'll allow, pass it on to Dimitrios and talk a bit about, you know, where is it that we are looking at evolving, you know, the world of supply chain in the services industry. And so I think that what, you know, I'd like to get Dimitrios to kind of talk to us a bit about where he thinks uh, the industry um, has gone over the last 18 months uh, and trying to figure out where directly or indirectly, um, you know, the the National Bank has really uh, changed its, its operating practices over the last 18 months. Dimitro? Thank you, uh, John, for uh, for inviting me. First of all, it's uh, very much appreciated to, to speak with everybody today. I think I think when you look at it from a, from a services perspective, uh, we've done a lot of elements that are are remote uh, work uh, from a, from a perspective of, of ensuring of all of our workers are there. And what's happened from a supply chain perspective is we've seen a lot of transversal leadership where a lot of people are touching a lot of different areas throughout the, the process. So one of the things we see a lot of is collaboration uh, that's going on uh, amongst units. And a lot of people are taking the time to take a step back and see if some of the processes are really necessary and, and have been able to uh, short uh, circumvent some of these uh, these processes that have gone on. So we've, we've, we've appreciated that. I think Things have become more agile. Uh, people always think uh, need something uh, yesterday, but I think what we've seen a lot of is uh, the agility and, and the collaboration has increased to make things happen. And I think uh, the elimination of silos has, has really contributed uh, as a silver lining towards this uh, pandemic that we've been going through. Great, thanks, Dimitri. Much appreciated. Um, I'm going to pass it off to um, 
Martin. And uh, Martin has in Resolute, I think a lot of people were kind of um, I'm trying to understand the supply chain in the start of the pandemic. And I was one of those consumers uh, standing in line, of course, waiting for my toilet paper or my paper towels back when. Uh, and uh, we were always trying to figure out, you know, what is it that's happened to the supply chain for pulp and for tissue paper? Uh, so I'm not going to ask you to go in there and try to, you know, to uh, <laughs> fix the problem, try to explain the problem, but just as generalities, like what's right. been the impact um, from your perspective at Resolute in terms of how the supply chain has evolved over the last 15 months? Right. Well, thanks again. Uh, thank you for inviting uh, inviting me. Glad, glad that we can do this remotely and glad to be here. But uh, but you're right. I mean, uh, in uh, in our world, I mean, we have different segment in our business, and the tissue was one that got a big surge at the beginning. And and quite frankly, it was uh, mainly a transition from the away from home business to the at home business. When you think about it, I mean, with all the restaurant, the hotel closing up and and people working from home i mean it's just changed the nature of the product you're buying and typically um typically uh, toilet paper um that is used at home is higher quality so it's different machine different production so it it, it, it was a surge uh, to start with but uh, unfortunately it was not the same um for uh, for the rest of our business uh, the publication paper resolute is largest uh, newsprint producer in the world uh, and, uh, and and this market has declined. I mean, this was an abrupt uh, 20 to 30 percent loss um, in, uh, in 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 sales and in in, uh, in in the demand. So uh, you see, our the public sack got very thin uh, last year at the, during the beginning of the pandemic. So so that got um, uh, that that got impacted fairly fairly highly. And then on the market pulp, um, thanks to Damir and all the uh, all the Amazon customer, I mean the box board market and the container board market uh, really expanded. And with the uh, the tissue uh, also growing, it kind of offset the loss on the paper. And finally, I mean we're also in the lumber business. Um, and anybody who's bought a two by four lately has seen the price, uh, which has reached. Um, uh, record high, uh, and the demand is extremely high uh, and extremely high uh, lately. So for us, it was uh, it was kind of uh, a lot of challenges because on one side, I mean, you see a very abrupt decline in the in one market with uh, mill closure, and on the other side, I mean, you see the very rapid growth and even starting back up capacity. So it has been uh, uh, ups and down, and uh, but uh, but a lot of that, a lot of moving parts, I would say, in the last 15 months. Great. I think that, you know, one of the things I wanted to make sure that we understood was really, you know, as supply chain professionals, and I teach in a supply chain program, of course, we talk about the bullwhip and the bullwhip impact on, on, on demand and surges in demand and then the corresponding um, flow of product and kind of match the demand. And uh, this probably the last eight, 15 months has probably been the, probably one of the more concrete examples of, um, of the bullwhip and how the bullwhip does, in fact, impact uh, across a number of supply chains. So thank you, Martin, much appreciated. And I'm gonna let Nikolai uh, jump in here and talk a bit about, you know, the, the, the Medtronic side of the business and trying to understand, you know, what is it about the business uh, of Met that Medtronic is in and how their group has made the supply chains more resilient and more sustainable. Nikolai, over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so. Look, Medtronic, uh, as a uh, uh, as a health, health uh, and medical equipment uh, uh, manufacturer, uh, faced this situation, uh, you know, at the maximum of its uh, uh, of its extent. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the, the adjustments in the production capacity, the agreements with their with the suppliers, uh, the increase. Uh, in the in the quantities uh, to be produced, uh, just kind of an example, uh, the ventilators uh, that uh, are used for the treatment of COVID-19, uh, the, the the capacity was increased by a thousand percent within uh, two uh, months, uh, and you know uh, the the business area so and, and the the the, uh, the 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 level uh, of of importance of each decision. Uh, sometimes bring the companies to be, you know, uh, fair to itself and say, "Hey guys, we can produce so much, but we cannot produce everything, right?" So 
uh, and one of the uh, examples of, of the you know, uh, courage decision that uh, Medtronic took in the past was uh, in March 2020, uh, the specification of the small ventilator uh, uh, that is also used uh, for the treatment of COVID-19 were put uh, on their posted on the open uh, in the open um, uh, network. And uh, uh, so technically Medtronic said, hey guys, uh, produce it if you can. Here are the here are the specifications, here's the technical information. Go for it because like uh, we cannot fulfill the demand uh, for uh, for the whole uh, world. So, you know, there are some business decisions to take, but there are some other humanitarian and and uh, uh, the um, you know um, the exist existential decisions to take as well. Great. Yeah, we've all we've all all heard about the uh, the ventilators and Medtronic's uh, initiative to uh, release the IP uh, to make it more of an open market product and. Uh, I think uh, that was probably one of the uh, the uh, hero stories uh, at the start of the pandemic to get that technology out there so people can in fact get more and more ventilators into the uh, into our hospitals into our into our uh, healthcare system. So um, thank you guys for introducing yourselves and talking about some of those specific subjects. Now, you know what I'd like to do is just kind of just go around the table and just talk about a couple of key words that kind of tend to describe. Um, you know, what should the supply chain look like uh, as a result of the experiences that we've all had over the last 18 months? And what are some of the characteristics that are going to have to, um, you know, become part of the way that we operate? So, you know, the, 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 two, the two principal terms that, that are coming out are things like resilience uh, and how resilient can your supply chain be? And, and the ability of the supply chain to basically try to understand demand and try to better um, forecast, you know, where demand is coming from. Um, and, you know, the, the resilience of the supply chain is, is something that people are trying to understand in terms of how can we, you know, look at situations where supply chains have evolved over the last 20, 25 years along a number of principles that, you know, people consider as lean, looking at reducing uh, inventory, looking at safety stock being reduced and trying to, to get um, you know, people to be make better use of their cash rather than sitting in inventory. Uh, and some people are saying that one of the things that happened within this COVID-19 um, supply chain uh, issue is that we ran out of inventory uh, or that our supply chains are too thin and that our supply chains are too long and that there's a need for us to rethink, you know, the way in which we design our supply chain so that we build in redundancy, we build in resilience, uh, and we build in visibility. So I'd just like to, you know, kind of throw that out uh, onto the floor and, you know, maybe I'll start with uh, Martin and see how Martin reacts to uh, what RFP's uh, view is about resilience and uh, visibility. Well, I mean, for sure, the um, if we talk about resilience, we can also talk about robustness. It was really tested in the last 15 months. That was uh, That was sure. In our business, um, we, um, uh, we've managed a declining business. Uh, the paper side of the business has been declining in the last uh, 15 years, I would say. And uh, as an organization, I mean, we uh, needed to take obviously more risk. I mean, in our, uh, in our world, I mean, it's, it's kind of the, um, on the paper side, I mean, it's the survival of the fittest, right? So uh, the last guy standing is gonna be the one with the lower production costs. And uh, and because of that, I mean, we've created uh, an environment where there is a lot of risk in our supply chain just to the procurement organization was built to actually uh, provide a competitive edge, you know, over our. Um, so the question you raise are, 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 are fundamental. I mean, those are the question that uh, we've been uh, we've been asking ourselves. And I think one of the key learning of the pandemic is 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 how do we. Um, how do we work much closer with operation to make sure that we really assess the risk and uh, and we really create a mitigation plan, you know, for uh, for 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 these risks. Uh, one example that we've been through is kind of an eye opener as far as risk assessment is uh, we've got this typical like supply chain. We get uh, two suppliers, one primary suppliers, one secondary supplier, 
and uh, and then the pandemic started and then we can became short you know of one of one commodity material that we're, we're buying without any issue and to find out when we started peeling the onion that that these suppliers raw material were our source from india and not only they were sourced from india but they were sourced from a same region in india which does happen very often you know they have a cluster of uh, uh so that was, I mean, so going like in the tier one, but also in the tier two and in the tier three of the supplier to really understand the fundamental of their supply chain and make sure on our side uh, that um, uh, that uh, we get some uh, flexibility and uh, some diversity in our uh, supply chain. So managing the the risk of, you know, leveraging our volume, but also uh, so those are those are questions that uh, I've been uh, I, I, some some example. I mean that were kind of eye opener to make sure that we deep dive a little bit more in the supply chain of our of our suppliers. Great, thanks, Martin. Dimitri, any comments from you on the national bank and how the national banks looked at resilience? Well, I, I would definitely say that it's a it's a test in your supplier partnerships uh, when when there is a shortage uh, out in the market. So if we take uh, uh, laptops, uh, you know, in terms of the shortages that's been going in, in chips in that area, you know, your partnerships are tested. Uh, you mentioned a little bit in terms of the of the forecasting, uh, you know, rather than sometimes the thinking of just on time, uh, just in time, you know, you could have some type of vendor uh, managed inventory. So I think there's some some aspects that that have uh, come out that that are being rethought and some concepts that were uh, in the past may may rekindle. I think the other thing that that's important is you know to understand the broader knowledge of your end to end supply chain in, in respect to who is doing what and which is which is the basics. But now it's going beyond that to look at the the suppliers suppliers, and I think that plays a, a large role uh, in ensuring that you're getting material. And the reason that you may or may not be getting material is because of the supplier supplier. So I think working with the suppliers to get to a level where you understand them a lot better. Uh, in respect to delivering and what are their, uh, you know, business continuity or disaster recovery plans uh, to get that going has an impact on you as an end customer. So I think that that's something that needs to be rekindled. And and the last piece I would add is, you know, similar to IT where they do heat maps in terms of what's core and 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 not core. I think that also has to be rekindled in in terms of, you know, there's there's just one thing that can ruin a whole supply chain to get something delivered and, and I think that'll play a larger role uh, moving forward. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think that you're, you're right. I think that there's a, there's a couple of tools and a couple of concepts that have been hanging around, particularly the world of supply chain risk management, uh, about you know what should we be looking at, what should organizations be looking at, and you're right, drilling down the supply chain to second and tier, uh, and as well as looking at you know things like heat maps are probably an interesting way of doing it, but risk is now becoming probably uh, a a greater uh, word that's being you know moved around the executive suite when it comes to supply chain and how much risk are you in are you incurring in the in the current design of, of your supply chain uh, do you understand risk and and how do you in fact mitigate against that risk so it's becoming much more prevalent exactly. and a lot of um, things that are, a lot of things that are going also is the tiering. Right, so pe so people are tiering their suppliers to ensure you know what levels of risk all of these suppliers are sitting. So that's a yeah. Well, I think that yeah, and then, and a prime example right now, if you happen to have a Ford F one fifty sitting out there that's on order, um, you know, and you're typically looking at getting a delivery off the production line that normally takes three to four weeks to get your F one fifty. Guess what? You know, see, you're now sitting at nine months to a year for that F one fifty. Why? Tier suppliers in chips associated with some of the components that are in that vehicle. And it's not just Ford, it's, you know, if you're looking at ways in which, you know, search single sourcing or limited sourcing has impacted, that is one example that's gonna cost the auto industry, the automobile industry, the automotive industry, over $100 billion worth of lost sales just in 2021, as a result of, you know, the risk that the industry was taking, is taking, on chip suppliers, and I think that's that's a very very you know uh, common example of other elements of supply chains having that level of risk. Um, I'm going to talk to Amazon for a second. I'm, you know, I think you know, Damir, you know, in your in your in your work with Amazon, 
you know, Amazon is, 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 a, is a lot of things to a lot to a lot of people. And I think if there's one thing that people look at on the Amazon process is the strength of the, of the Amazon supply chain uh, and your ability to order to, for me to order today and get it tomorrow. Uh, wherever the product happens to be, and, I, and, and sometimes it's pretty amazing, but I know that that's not just happenstance. There's a lot of design, there's a lot of thinking that's going on in, in, in the Amazon supply chain. So my question to you on, on, on that supply chain, like how do you, how does Amazon really understand the world of risk and, and, and how fragile that supply chain can be and how is Amazon trying to deal with that level of second or third tier supplier that might be in their chain by maintaining those relationships uh exactly what demetrius was saying is the suppliers of the suppliers making sure that they don't overcommit in terms of uh, uh promising something that they can not deliver because amazon will not promise a customer something that amazon can't deliver so resilience is really an approach to fulfilling that promise in terms of the supply chain and, and service, the last mile. So everything Amazon is doing is uh, basically strategic uh, planning, extreme data analytics based on the customer uh, demand. And thankfully we have a lot of customers so we can evaluate uh, processes and forecast it accordingly. Uh, I cannot even explain the complexity of, <laughs> of uh, the algorithms we have and all the input we have from the customers to establish those. And we also, have that ability to bypass cost. We're going to service the customer no matter what the cost is. And uh, the resilience of the supply chain really is based on the availability and potential of performance of the suppliers. So that relationship that uh, Martin and uh, Demetrius were talking about, uh, being able to get the right forecast of the suppliers, what can you commit to, what can you give us? And uh, Amazon's standpoint is that if you fail on this promise, uh, like we do not fail our customers. Uh, therefore, the suppliers know not to uh, overcommit. The suppliers know not to uh, overestimate their capacity and ability. Therefore, what we offer is what we can fulfill. And I believe in today's society and the uh, supply chain world, people do um, a certain amount of uh, panic buying and stockpiling, and that results in the heavy backlog. Uh, and uh, you know, like if I get an order today from a medium sized business and like, it's as if I will not get an order tomorrow. So I'm going to sell it to one, uh, in one direction instead of, uh, making every single customer happy. Like, and then, okay, well, you're on a backlog, like Demetrius, you're going to be on a backlog. Martin, you're going to be on a backlog. Nikolai, you as well. I'm going to give it all to John because he was first going to come for serve. Although John actually ordered, uh, five times more than he usually does. So my advice there to every single business would be ensure that you can cover everybody to the capacity that they were asking not to rush and uh, resilience is built by patience and more strategic approach to things not by first come first serve but more like what's sustainable so sustainability and big data analytics is exactly what is the right approach to these we ran out of uh, paper we ran out of everything not because people needed it more but because people were panic buying and uh, resilience can only be done by capping it. Like at one point, I remember, like we only sobered up after two, three months when people were putting caps on milk, eggs, and every all flour. We should have been prepared for this more. Some other countries implemented that in the first week of pandemic. Uh, Canada, for example, didn't. So we need to ensure to have reality check, even in terms of supply chain, when we are looking at the profit and uh, like the expedition of supply chain building, there's always going to be more. We need to look at the commodities. We need to go to the granular level of uh, suppliers and their suppliers. And once that we get the commitment from them, what's feasible and reality, then we can make commitment to the customer. Yeah, and I think that you know that's what that was one thing that I that I remember distinctly. Um, you know, people hoarding, and people just. Go, I remember going into a, a Costco store. Uh, not that I'm a fan of Costco at any point in time, but I saw people with carts and they were carrying out, you know, 30 or 40 12 packs of toilet paper or 30 or 40 12 packs of paper towels. And I'm, and I'm saying that's a, that's a lot for a family. And then, and then some people are carrying two or three of those carts around. So they, the retailers or the distributors had to put caps 
on the number of, of, uh, of units that you could take. And I remember going in and you see signs saying, we're, we're out of toilet paper, we're out of tissue paper, we're out of Heinz ketchup, we're out of mustard. Uh, and, you know, and you say to yourself, is it really a shortage or is there a, a buying perspective? Is there a certain behavior being done by the consumer that's causing these shortages to be there? And, you know, how do we... You know, you, you want to basically be able to put what I call circuit breakers in there somehow, some way to basically say, hey, wait a second, you know, this is this is behavior and this is buying, which is which could lead to, to disruption in the supply chain. And so I, I got to ask the question to, to my buddy Nikolai, you know, in terms of uh, trying to understand. So, you know, how much is, does does consumer but behavior and consumer psychology, you know, really affect, you know, the management of a supply chain? Nikolai? Uh, look, I had the same reaction uh, a year or more than that uh, ago when uh, I saw those uh, uh, amounts of the toilet paper uh, moving from the grocery store to the cars and uh, had the same kind of uh, puzzling reaction. Uh, look, uh, there, is, there is always over and other reaction from, from the consumers. Uh, what we can do, we can kind of try to create some sort of the mechanism uh, blocking the automation of those reaction and 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 um, uh, transition of that reaction into the supply chain. Uh, and you know, uh, at Medtronic, we did face this kind of uh, uh, overreaction, uh, and some of them were really natural ones. You know, so what we had to do from time to time is to put the manual uh, blockages to it and let the human decide whether uh, these volumes make sense. And if, let's say, there is a limited supply, decide what with that supply can be done uh, at the best of, you know, uh, customers and consumers uh, um, uh, need. Uh, so, I mean, there is also, you know, the human interface, human reaction, but there is also the automation of the business. So the truth is somewhere uh, in between. Uh, we're gonna I'm not sure if trip. I answer in your question, uh, John. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, you're good. You know, I think the, the question is we're gonna have to figure out, you know, as supply chain professionals, you know, what is the best way for us to basically ensure the integrity of our supply chain, and uh, you know, wh whether it's heavy-handed or whether it's not, you know, somehow, somehow, some way, uh, we have to have some early warning systems um, to to kind of say, okay, wait a second, it just looks like this behavior is going to cause you know, a disruption in the chain and is just wondering how to figure out what that disruption is going to look like. Um, Martin, let's just talk a bit about, um, you know, what does a supply chain professional uh, need to have in terms of skills and capabilities and, and just background to basically be a success in the evolution of the supply chain for Resolute as an example? Well, I think I touched base a little bit on on it before. I mean, in our, I mean, obviously there's some uh, uh, skill set on. I mean, not skill set, but the. Uh, I think the sense of urgency in our case is very important. Has been very important in that. Don't leave any rock unturned, and making sure we go as deep as we can. You know, into the analysis and things like so. So obviously, this is a skill set that we're looking for, and 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 that I think our team was was built around just because of the nature of the, of our business and how we manage it. Um, uh, obviously, also the um, the da the data analytic. I think. Um, in the paper industry, I mean, we're not uh, as advanced as, uh, I'm not pretending to be as advanced as an Amazon would be, but the data analytic is, uh, is, is very important. One of the thing that we, um, uh, that we realize uh, through the pandemic is that part of our business doesn't have a full uh, ERP implemented and, and, and then production was not really link with demand planning and this this kind of uh, this was done manually and 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 communication had some breakdown so uh, so i think there's 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 important to be able to uh, uh to uh, so data analytic and also um and also the to the transactional um excellence piece of it so uh, there's we have two function in our group i got a, a, a i got a, a sourcing a strategic sourcing group but also i have a um, a transactional group which is more focused on the um, on the pure transaction and this uh, those require different skill set but um, 
but it also proven that digi digitalization of the procurement was was very important. We cannot leave uh, uh, we cannot leave mistake out there, you know, especially in times like that. So there's different skill set depending on uh, on on where we stand. But I think being very thorough on one end and uh, be, be, being very analytic and uh, and uh, and also dealing with uh, that sense of urgency that I mentioned before uh, is is important for our business for sure. Great, thank you, Dimitri. What do you think for the bank, for the bank national? Yeah, I, I'd echo some of the points that, that that Martin touched on in terms of data analytics and, and digitization. I think for me, uh, a couple of things. The first one would be around the big picture. You know, can you succinctly state advantages and, and disadvantages in the current situation? Can you project current state versus future state? Because a lot of us are now getting, you know, seats at the, at the executive table. So I think, you know, working on your big picture capabilities, I think, is is something that would be important. The other, the other thing that I would separate things is, is the, the three spheres that I usually talk to a lot of people about is, you know, around people processes and technology. So, you know, from a people perspective, or are you a collaborator? Uh, do you have leadership? Are you able to build relationships? Uh, are you, are you able to understand complementary fields, you know, around procurement and even to the point of, of stock markets and commodity markets, you know, that's that's very important because a lot of these things that we follow uh, outside of what we do from a day-to-day -day perspective does impact us. So, be curious. Right? You know, if you're curious, uh, I think that leads uh, to a lot of things. I, I I look at something called Cheddar News, which is uh, something that they talk about IT, which is uh, you know they'll they'll talk about some supply chain things that I I I wouldn't be well versed if if I did some uh, some other types of media. So. You know, be curious, go out there, look at things, um, make sure that you understand, you know, especially what's going on in the commodity market, uh, because that has a lot of impacts further down the chain. You know, you look at, the, you talked about cars before, John, uh, you look at, in, in respect to electric vehicles, uh, you're looking at 20 kilograms of nickel for an electric car, uh, and now it's going to 50. So, you know, what's going on in that, in that nickel space? And how does it touch, you know, your your particular thing? I work for a bank. Well, one day we're going to have electric vehicles parking in front of our branches. So understanding these things and being able to connect things from places that you didn't really think you would need to connect, I think that plays a large part uh, in ensuring that success. Great, thank you, Dimitri. Well, I think we are, uh, you know, moving along quite briskly in our in our one hour allocation of time here. So I think we're going to talk a bit about some questions. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Julia, who's uh, been uh, monitoring the, uh, the, the the chat and the Q&A and uh, see if she can come up with some questions for us to, to deal with. Julia, over to you. Hello, John. So we we have quite a lot of questions here. Uh, we'll I'll start with the first one. We got one from from John, actually. Uh, so he's saying, what are the most exciting technology opportunities that are expected? to i'm so sorry it was just wrote out um, expected to major uh, impact towards supply chain management what capabilities do you want to see develop and grow great dimitri you want to try that one first yeah uh i i would say uh the internet of things is is, is playing a large uh, role from a technological perspective anything that's connected uh, will will play a role, but there's also the cybersecurity aspect of it. Be careful what you wish for. So whatever's whatever's connected, also from a security and, and a data perspective, uh, you have to be ready to to take care of that. So that that would be a major thing. And obviously, with five G playing a large uh, role going forward, I think the the Internet of, of Things and five G will play a large role. The other thing that I would say is, you know, in 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 the banks business, a lot of things are in the cloud. Uh, on-premise licenses, et cetera. A lot of that is, is yesterday's news. Everything is uh, in the cloud. And there's a lot of things in the cloud that you uh, have advantages in, in terms of uh, building something up quickly and getting up, but you also have that aspect where you're committed for a longer term. So you have to make sure, are you able to get out of that commitment? And what are the steps that you do uh, if you need to move forward, and what are the terms and conditions that you have going forward? So that's what I would tell uh, on that side of the, the place. I know Amazon has been really on a hiring spree these days and trying to understand, you know, what type of skill sets and what type of technologies 
are evolving. Amir, you want to uh, take a shot at trying to give us your view about technology and its evolution within supply chain? Um, of course, Amazon is hiring uh, all the smart people we can get, and we're welcoming anybody to apply because uh, we're managing and hiring the best. It's one of our leadership principles, actually. So regarding technology, um, in terms of the supply chain management, uh, the routing tools, and I've been in this industry for 15 years, uh, the middle mile and last mile, and also even the, in our Amazon Air, it's a class up. It's a class act in terms of uh, algorithms and in terms of uh, schematics, and it's actually really based on reality. So there is no, uh, there's no room for error. Uh, it's fine combing. There's a lot of footwork being done. Uh, again, would be a topic for another day, but if I'm impressed with, uh, with the technology that I see after 15 years and I'm like, wow, like, um, th there's companies who have been doing this for a hundred plus years and Amazon just started like last mile, for example, and, uh, the algorithms behind it is something that in people from the industry could only have dreamed of. So before, like it was something that we desired and, uh, it's really impressive. So the way that it's actually conducted is I based on as um, as the Demetrius was saying, internet is gold, data is present like live, and the companies who actually get the live data and analyze it as fast as possible in terms of being able to mitigate risks, whether it's no mile, last mile, first mile, supplier, commodities, that's the companies that are gonna come, come on top and grow. So strategic planning and forecasting based on big data and analytics. That's what I'm gonna keep saying. and. Best data analyst wins. Great. Thank you. And uh, Nikolai, what do you think? Technology going to disrupt the chain again? Uh, I will say that we can use technology in our advantage, right? So, uh, example at uh, the School of Continuous Studies in, in, uh, of McGill, we use the technology to, you know, learn and experience uh, the challenges without uh, passing through them, like in pandemic, right? So, we learned here hard. But what we try to do in our program is to uh, help students to, uh, to have that experience in the business simulation uh, simulations that allow them to kind of uh, have that learning curve uh, uh, shorten and and uh, and be ready for the for the real time situations uh, like that uh, uh, you know by having a sort sort of this uh, uh, skill set and the and the methodologies. And the tools uh, to face uh, these situations. We have, uh, you know, end-to-end -end, uh, supply chain uh, simulations. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, um, working capital, uh, IBP, integrated business planning uh, variants. We have the conversion of the linear uh, the business into the circular economy uh, uh, types of simulations. So all that helps to not only kind of uh, uh, experience the similar risks uh, that potentially might happen in future, but also prepare students and uh, young professional for, for these situations in the real life. Great, thank you. Any other questions that come up that uh, are pretty popular from the group, uh, Julia? Yes, well, I see one here on the top uh, that uh, it's from Anand, and uh, he's asking, are you seeing evidence of near and multi-assuring practices setting in? If so, how increase demand for uh, warehousing? What type, uh, long-term, short-term, uh, and where, uh, urban or brownfield? Uh, Martin, you want to try that one? Um, it's, I mean, on our side, I mean, it's, um, uh, it's this is pretty stable. I think that we're not selling directly to consumer. I mean, we're, uh, um, we're, we're more in the B2B business. So, uh, and I missed the 1st part of the question about offshoring. So, in our side, I mean, most of what, I mean, we sell mostly in North America and in uh, elsewhere, but I don't see for us a big, a big change on, on, on that. No, I, I don't believe so. Yeah, and I think that the, the, the question probably, you know, looks at trying to understand, you know, how long and how thin. Uh, have supply chains evolved over the last decade or so, right. and you know what's the risk? Uh, what what has what have, what have people identified as the risk of those long thin supply chains? Right. Uh, and I think that that's where uh, people are saying, well, do they ha can we in fact shorten the chain? Can we in fact strengthen the chain uh, so that we in fact look at mitigating that risk? 
Well, the okay. easy answer to that, I mean, it, obviously, I mean, it, it would make everybody happy if, 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 if you had access to more product and more inventory, but I don't think that's the answer. I mean, we've been managing through that crisis and I would talk for on our end pretty successfully. I mean, uh, I'm not the one to crash the party, but, uh, you know, it's been, uh, it, it has tested our supply chain. Uh, it has tested our method, but, uh, but we navigated through it and, uh, and came out. So. Is that it doesn't mean that we shouldn't change anything, but I don't think we should like completely, um, completely like uh, reverse engineering everything that we've done for years too. I mean, so there's some key learning, but uh, uh, but again, there's no secret sauce, there's no special ingredient. I mean, it's uh, it's having the right people, the right culture, and the and and the right focus. So and the right tools. Um, and just maybe to uh, add on the last question, um, so I think we've talked a lot about the front end, the demand planning and the data analytic, but also having access to tools to better source, um, which, uh, which uh, you know, with ERP, I mean, and, and things like that, we have some, but platform like Ariba or Coupa or, or these things, getting access to new supplier, expanding your network, uh, all of this is also uh, a, a, a way to uh, to mitigate the risk and to improve on the supply chain without having to store and to stock piles and piles of uh, uh, of, of material, which which I don't think business wise is uh, is the right approach. I don't I, I don't think your your controller and your CFO would nope. like to see inventory would like to see inventory levels jump. That's nope. not so. That's not the answer to the question. The question is right sizing the inventory. Nope. Um, so it's, I think that one of the things that, you know, a couple of questions I saw whooping through there were questions about ERPs and, uh, you know, should I learn about ERPs or should I learn about SAP first? You know, and I think that, you know, ERPs, you know, are becoming, you know, ubiquitous in this whole pre this whole business. Everybody's, anybody that's anybody in, in, the, in the business of supply chain uh, really has to have, you know, a knowledge of where everything is, having display, having availability, having pricing, having inventory, knowing your suppliers and connecting your suppliers ERP to your ERP. So you know, I think one, you know, the answer to that question is that ERPs basically are a fundamental piece of today's and tomorrow's supply chain. And, you know, if you haven't got an ERP, uh, and it doesn't really matter, you know, the complexity, you don't necessarily need, you know, a, a you know, a, an SAP or a, or, 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 or a, you know, a, a brand name ERP to get you going. I think you need to have a process established about looking at getting information about your supply chain. And I think one of the terms that I've been using is something called a supply chain control tower. Um, and supply chain control towers basically are, are there to basically help organizations try to understand the state of their supply chain and to predict where failures might happen and how do you mitigate against those potential failures. And I think that you know that's a concept from a technology perspective that we'll be hearing more and more about is you know how do you go about getting visibility in your supply chain, your supplier's supply chain, your second tier supplier, and even your third tier supplier, because the more visibility that you have within the elements of your supply chain, uh, the better off you'll be in identifying where risk you know could happen and how do you mitigate against that risk as quickly as possible. Um, I think that you know we're we're kind of butting into the edge of our uh, of our time slot, so I'd like to uh, just have a, a quick uh, round table from all of my participants and basically give any parting words that you might have and words of advice to our uh, participants about where do you see you know the challenges associated with you know the evol evolution of supply chain. So Dimitri, I'm going to start off with you. Yeah, I, I would say that from a, from a challenge perspective, uh, obviously, when you look at things uh, holistically throughout the, the supply chain, the question becomes, how do you ensure that you're, you're addressing things? I talked a little bit about doing a heat map and, and seeing where you're at, looking at processes uh, in respect to the ability to deliver and to see where some shortcomings are. And, and I think I'll just leave you, and, and I use the theme a lot of people, process, and technology. It's really in that order. You have to ensure that you engage your people, uh, ensure that uh, the people are, are ready to be uh, face the challenges that are coming, and the challenges will always be there. Uh, and how do you make sure that you're, you're able to uh, succumb those those challenges is by ensuring that you're you're training your people, you're speaking with them, and you're also sharing experiences. And, and I think those would be uh, 
some of the parting words that, that I, I would leave you with. And the last thing, you got to be curious. You have to be curious. You got to love what you do. No matter what it is, love what you do. Be curious. Look at things beyond what you're doing on a, on a day-to-day perspective because it will contribute towards your future success. And do it well. And do it well. <laughs> and quickly. All right. And quickly. <laughs> Martin? Um, I think we've touched base a little bit on that, but I think it's just um, the, the, the all... Uh, last 15 months really put the emphasis on uh, key supplier relationship, uh, partnership, and I, I this word has been used uh, wrongly, I would say, uh, and it's been loose, it's been used a lot. But you know, if you're as important to your customer, to your supplier, that he is important for you, building on that, and you have very few of them, but then leverage the other relationship throughout uh, your industry. And uh, and I mean, there's uh, there's one phrase my first boss told me is that. Like people can survive the old way, people can survive the new way is the transition that kills. So are we going to get through this end of this pandemic? I think we're not, we're not finished yet. Um, there's a lot of collateral damages that we're seeing, labor shortage, material uh, availability, pricing, volatility in the pricing. So there's a lot of uncertainty right now. So uh, organization that uh, have been able to uh, manage changes effectively in the past, um, a, a are the one that I think are gonna are gonna raise out of this uh, pandemic uh, probably ahead of the curve. So embrace uh, changes and uh, look at that as for as opportunity. So thank you, Martin. Nikolai, what do you think? I think I think we learned a lot in this uh, in this pandemic, and uh, uh, what actually changed as a result of it is that we see that how vulnerable uh, uh, we are uh, to the potential risks. Uh, we see a lot of political and competitive pressure to uh, to kind of um, increase the the local production, to increase the local growth of the employment employment, uh, intention to reduce uh, and uh, eliminate the dependence on the on the um, sources that are perceived as the risky ones, uh, and you know try to minimize the investments into the inventory. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, re rethink the, the the idea of being purely lean uh, and rethink the level of protection by having uh, a good inventory in the right place and right uh, right place and right quantities but what will not change is the uh, customer's intention to have uh, a high variability of products for the low price and the competition is not getting uh, easier so companies have to have the business continuity plan uh, be ready for the force majeure situations. Have a good protection at the at their uh, supplier side, and in the in the situations of uh, similar to uh, COVID, focus on the cash flow. Uh, think about where the money are. Great. And uh, last word goes to uh, our man from Amazon, Demir. Uh, change management as uh, quickly the companies reacted to the pandemic and established themselves in the new reality of the supply chain. That's how companies need to uh, prepare themselves to get out of the pandemic as well. Uh, it comes from increasing capacity in meeting customer demands in various forms, but more or less, like how do you get, for example, 70% of the workforce that's working from home, from home now back in potential offices or not. So some uh, heavy decisions are to be made, seeing what the positive effects of uh, uh, working uh, remotely are, like uh, making sure that uh, the capacity is increased on all accounts and focus on what's most important. Okay. Individuals working as well as the customer demand, right? So it's gonna be fun times ahead. <laughs> That's for sure. All right, so uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for participating in today's session. It's been a uh, entertaining, enlightening, and a very instructive session. Thank you very much. Folks for being part of this. Um, and as part of the ongoing effort by McGill to kind of talk about supply chain, I just wanted to remind everybody that we have uh, two programs at McGill and supply chain. One is at the uh, certificate undergraduate level, and one is at the diploma in our graduate level. Um, the topics you heard today, part of our regular routine, and you, you'll, hear, you'll, you'll hear more about those programs from professors like myself and from Nikolai and from guest lecturers like Martin and from uh, Dimitri, hopefully, will be able to participate in our sessions over the next few months. So thank you very much for, for uh, taking the time. I'm gonna pass it back to Julia, who will introduce um, our sponsor.
for today's session. Julia, over to you. Thank you, John. So now I'll pass it over to to Matthew from Supply Chain Canada, who will speak to you uh, about the, the association. Thank you, Matthew. Great, thanks so much, Julia. So hi, everyone. I'm Matthew Kloss. I'm manager of programs and member services for Supply Chain Canada in our Quebec Institute. So it was a real pleasure for us to support this uh, event with McGill School of C Continuing Education. Um, we join everyone in thanking the excellent panelists and knowing how much everyone has on their plates. One has to be grateful that you're spending time with us and sharing with us and uh, inspiring us to be more curious. Thank you, Dimitri. So um, not everyone is aware of, of Supply Chain Canada, so I'll give you a 30 second uh, introduction and invite you to contact me if you have any more questions or anything to, to discuss. Uh, we are a national association of supply chain professionals with about 7,500 members, and our vision is to ensure that Canadian supply chain professionals and organizations are recognized for leading innovation, global competitiveness, and driving economic growth. So we undertake uh, many different initiatives to support our members um, and advocate for the profession. Um, one thing I just thought of, uh, John was mentioning the uh, supply chain control tower. So we just had a webinar yesterday for our Quebec members with SAP. Uh, talking uh, about this supply chain control tower. Um, another example, uh, we administer the SCMP professional title, supply chain management professional, and we actually have agreements with schools like McGill School of Continuing Studies where graduates get uh, advanced standing in the pathway to the title. So something to consider as for students as you finish your studies and as your career develops. So I invite you to check us out. Uh, if you contact the Quebec Institute, you'll reach me. Again, my name is Matthew Gloss. I'd be very pleased to talk to you. And thanks again to John and Julia, the whole team and the panelists for today's great event. Thank you, Matthew. So now we'll pass it over uh, to Diana and Niall who will talk about a bit more about CATS. So oh. thank you, Diana and Niall. Thank you, well, thank you, Julia. Thank you, Matthew, for sponsoring the event. And thank you, John, for facilitating such a great session. Uh, I'll make sure to make this quick. So my name is Nayel Garietti. I'm a career advisor uh, in the Career Advising and Transition Services team of McGill School of Continuing Studies. Uh, we're also known as CATS. So our services are open to uh, current students, alumni, and potential students for everyone here in the room. Uh, we're really here to help you present clear career goals, uh, recognize your value, your skills, uh, for a successful job transition and career development at any point in your career journey. Uh, we offer, of course, career-related activities, events, resources, and a very supportive network. So to make this long story short, of course, uh, our services include, but definitely not limited to, individual advising and coaching sessions about almost anything career-related from helping you navigate the Montreal job market, articulating your skills, optimizing your LinkedIn, and so much more. Uh, you can register using the link in the chat or going directly on our website. Uh, we also have soft skills training, job search uh, workshop, community exchange via multiple social media platforms like LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and YouTube. And of course, uh, we have internship and strategic volunteering initiative. Uh, just to finish off, I'll uh, talk about our latest edition. So we just launched a new mentoring platform in collaboration with 10,000 Coffee. So if you're not already there, make sure to join. Uh, you'll have the link, like I said, in the chat. And we have plenty of virtual networking events uh, like Career Coffee Chat on that platform. So if I can just finish off by maybe saying uh, one key takeaway is that CATS is here for you to support you with your lifelong career management skills and the tools needed to thrive in today's current labor market. So thanks everyone, and we really look forward to meeting all of you. Thank you very much, Nayo. So I guess this is a wrap. Um, thank you so very much for all of you for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed this session. Uh, as we mentioned before, we will be sending you the recording of the session um, within uh, 24 hours or, or so, and you'll be able to watch it. And uh, the recording will also be available on the web page of our supply chain programs. Um, so you can share it with your friends. Uh, and I, we also, of course, would like to uh, give a big, big, big thank you to our host, John, and our panelists, Martin, Demetrios, uh, Nikolai, and Demir. Uh, also, thank you very much, Matthew from Supply Chain Canada uh, for joining us. Also, 
Thank you very much, Naya and Diana from CAPS for also joining us. We wish you a lovely afternoon and thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.